welcome friends for this afternoon session you can hear me at the back no can you hear me now at the back welcome friends for this afternoon session of this first day of our three day program in sari greater vancouver area i am again happy to see all of you and this is a moment when we can really look at our life and see is our time come are we ready we do self evaluation before we ask anybody else are we ready how do we answer that question have we done enough that we had to do here have we finished what our role seems to be here have we performed our duties that we were supposed to do here have we fulfilled our dharma our duties based upon our karma which was our destiny did we look at our destiny of pralab the karma what we were born with have we lived up to it and feel that it is done that we have to now go back home these are the questions we ask ourselves and if the answer is yes you done what you could this is no longer necessary to be here whatever you wanted to do has been done you are no longer interested in doing anything more here you are ready if you feel no there is so much left for me to do and i have to take care of so many things then you have to stay here to take care of so many things and to do a lot of things that you have to do so there is a certain time that comes in our life when we feel we are ready to go back home it is not necessary for everybody to have the same time therefore a perfect living master appears in our life and appears as a perfect living master only when the time is right otherwise he is just a human being like anybody else for those who are not ready but merely curious to know what's going on we are we are not interested in going back there no true home we, this is our home but we are curious to know what's going on they will never see a perfect living master as anybody other than ordinary person because he will be ordinary person when such people will say other people are saying he has something special let's test him out and they will go to test him out he will always fail because he is not there to pass an exam he is not there to prove anything he is come to take the marked souls who are ready back to their true home and that is why it looks very strange sometimes these perfect living masters sometimes they seem to deliberately say yeah we fail you t- test us out we fail if you don't test them out we pass if you come up with love and devotion they always pass you come up out of a curiosity that i am going to examine i want to see is he really a, a perfect master perfect master fails because he know that the mind game is still playing in that person he is not ready yet but it is a curiosity mental curiosity that has brought him there that is why we can never really test a master he will behave according to our mind he becomes a mirror of our own mind when we are ready he is ready when we love him he loves we can see it feel it but if we are merely saying we let's test him out then he fails in the test if somebody says to a perfect living master are you a master he says of course not am i he might even say do i look like somebody different just like anybody else there is no difference so this question of when we are ready is start from our own heart start from our own evaluation of where we are if somebody says i am happy and i want to live here go ahead you lived for a long time already a little more time won't matter supposing somebody says i am ready but still something is pulling me then you are ready but you are still to take care of what is pulling you it can happen 
It does happen in many cases that a person is ready for the spiritual path, for spiritual journey, but something else is pulling which one wants to detach, but is not able to detach. Sometimes it is children, sometimes it is wealth, sometimes it is some other item that pulls you back to which you are attached. And yet you are ready. It's only a little part of you is still being pulled. Major part is ready. In that case, a perfect living master will accept you and give you time to get over that attachment. So it's not necessary that you should be completely detached when you're ready. Your pull inside should be there that you want to go to a true home, you are ready for it, though I have some little problems to take care of. So perfect living master in this human form will accept you. And his acceptance is called, sometimes it's called initiation. It's called, sometimes called namdan or it's a, a, a diksha or or a blessing, or it can be called acceptance, or it doesn't matter what name is used. What happens during that initiation or acceptance is that the perfect living master says, I am now going to be with you forever. I was driving in the car right now to come to this place, and somebody has sent me a song from Guru Granth Sahib which is the opening words and the refrain of the song was, my Satguru is always with me. That is, and that's it, continuously it sings, that's the refrain. And I noticed that it is talking of the one who is accepted. The master is always with that person from the time of acceptance. When he says, I accept you, or I initiate you, or I take you, I give you my blessings, at that time he's with that person inside, can be seen inside, can be have a, a conversation inside, just like we have outside. In fact, a better conversation can be take, taking place inside better than even outside. So this is a very big thing, that we are not dealing with some teacher who is teaching us something and then we have to follow the teachings and do something. This is a relationship, which is internal relationship and continues forever. A, a master's initiation like that is forever. And it is not teaching. I remember in my own master's case, there was a very poor man who used to have visions of great master. He used to have seen somebody appearing in his dreams or in his thoughts maybe, that there was a man with a white beard who appeared. For a long time he thought that is Guru Nanak because he belonged to the Sikh faith and he said Guru Nanak is appearing into my vision. He is trying to help me to do something. When the visions became more clear, he asked somebody who was also a satsangi of Great Master, follower of Great Master, I am getting these visions. He said these are visions of Great Master Baba Savan Singh. He is calling you and that's why you are seeing him. He said, really, I will go. He had no money. He packed his few belongings in a piece of cloth and just tied them up and carried on his shoulder. And he had no money for a bus fare. He had no money for a train fare. He walked. He walked almost a month to reach the Dera. And the day he reached the Dera, it is just a coincidence that a few satsangis, including myself, were standing outside Great Master's house and he was coming out of the door. As he came, stepped out of the door, we saw this man full of dirt and dust and after all this travel, throw his bag and leap forward towards the master and put his head on his feet and said, Master, give me Namdhan, initiate me. And master said, what once again? He's seeing you the first time physically. He said, what, once again? And then he said, you know, you were initiated a month ago before you left for the Dera. When you saw the vision, you were initiated at that time because of a previous initiation in a past life. And now you are come, I will give you the form, formal things about how to meditate tomorrow. So it's a great opening for us that initiation is not teachings. 
Initiation does not mean teaching how to meditate. Anybody can teach you that. Books are there to teach you that. Practice, people are practicing on their own so, many, so much meditation. That is not initiation. Perfect living masters are not teachers. They pretend to be teachers for the sake of our mind. We like to be taught something so we can learn. So they become teachers. But they are not teachers. They are coming because of our arrangement, because of our time to go back home. They come back to take us back home. And initiation means a guaranteed return to our, to our true home with that master. It is something so remarkable, I do not see any parallel of that anywhere. That here an ordinary human being comes into our life and can take us back to our origin, to our totality of consciousness, from where the whole creation took place. That can show us who we are part, inseparable part of the creator. Separation is only an illusion, a part of creation. That we have never been separated. The separation that we are experiencing is a created separation for the sake of a different experience. That when we go back home, we don't feel we have arrived somewhere. We were always there. It's awakening. When you go to sleep and have a dream in which you are running around somewhere, so no, I want to come back where I'm sleeping. If you come to know, some dreams are like that. You feel that you are sleeping and you have to go back and find where you are sleeping. And you're running around, if you wake up, you find you went nowhere. You were right there. The dream took place there. That is why when we reach our true home, we discover we never left it. We only had a dream-like experience of different levels of consciousness. And that it all took place there. These different levels have been created only by our own consciousness to diversify the experience that consciousness can have. The very first experience from totality of consciousness, which is the only reality, that's the totality of our self, that's our true self, always the true self, never changed. That's totality of consciousness, which is true self, that creates the first illusion which I might call individuation, that we feel we are separate from the total. We are separate from the total and therefore you have to search the total. We become a seeker of our own self just by the illusion of separation. We are a soul. We are not total. We are soul looking for our origin, the totality. But we are still part of totality. We just close down our awareness. This is an important point. Because when I was young, I was told by followers of my master and by other people who followed spiritual teachings that our soul is like a drop from the ocean. We are separated. We have left the ocean and now we are wandering around like a little drop and our time has come to go back and merge in the ocean. So with great difficulty, struggle, meditation, fasting, rituals. We have to do all those things. Religion taught us how to do those things. They will do all those things so the drop can go, fly back slowly, slowly, through various stages, ultimately merge in the ocean. Now, I must tell you that no matter I was young, I was thinking that this is the most stupid game. That I am now a drop, I am conscious of being a drop. I am happy to be a drop. The sun shines on me and I make like a rainbow on myself. I can do all the things. I have a great life. And what they are telling me is follow a spiritual path so you get and go into the ocean and get lost. Ocean will get nothing by one more drop and I lose all my identity. What kind of spiritual game is this? It's a lose-lose game. That at least this drop has some identity. It lose everything it has by merging in an ocean. And the ocean is there peaceful. One more drop doesn't matter. It, one drop makes no difference to the ocean. But I was wrong. I understood it wrong. The truth was that I am a drop that never left the ocean. I was the ocean. 
that contracted my awareness to the point of a drop. And the spiritual path was no journey. It was expansion of consciousness, expansion of awareness to a bigger drop, to bigger drop, to totality of the ocean. I was always the ocean. Then it made sense because now the spiritual path means uh, my real identity is not a drop. The real identity is the ocean. And I have just, for the sake of an experience of separation, become a drop. And when I realize I am a drop, it's for an experience, I go back. What experience do, do we get? An ocean trying to become a drop, what experience can it have? It can have an experience if the ocean is not, morally, not merely the creative power, but is also love. That's why they say God is love. And love is God. Why do they use these phrases that God is love? Because it is love. Now, there is totality of love. Let's replace the word ocean. Let's replace the word God. There is totality of ocean, love. And now what's experience what is love? It becomes the many. The many can experience love between themselves. Love becomes an experience. Otherwise, it's just love. So the creation of a separation was to have the experience of our own nature as totality. That's beautiful. That the love that was total could be experienced in this form. And all other forms of experiences that were created through the mind, through the senses, through the physical body, were also to be used for experience of love. Love could be experienced in every form and can be experienced even here. But we made a little mistake, a small mistake when we came to the physical plane that instead of taking love what it was, which is oneness, the understanding that we are together and one, that we have not really separated, it's only an experience of separation. Love removed the separation. That was the intention. What we did was, we called another experience of ours, called attachment, and began to call it love. All attachments were love for us. I love this thing. No, you're not loving this, you're attached. I love you. Do you know when somebody says very vehemently and strongly, I get very suspicious. I love you, I love you. Why so much emphasis? Because you know what the emphasis is on? Watch the words. I love you, I love you. Emphasis on I, ego. It's an ego game. People are conscious of themselves the lover doing something good for somebody called beloved. When somebody says, I love you, as if I am, you should be grateful to me for what I am doing. And patronizing through the process of, I love you. Who is more in that consciousness or awareness of that person? I. I am doing this. It's an ego game. Whereas, when you really have love for somebody, which you all have, so many times we have fallen in love with people. When we fall in love with people, the beloved occupies the place in our head. We don't think of I. Beloved. We miss the beloved. We think of the beloved. The I is put back on the back backbencher when there's true love. And it's not that the I comes first. The beloved comes first. That is why true love does not flow from the lover to the beloved. True love flows from the beloved that pulls the lover into it and makes him a lover. A Persian, Farsi little saying is, Ishq awal dar dile ma shuk paida mishwad. Love is first born in the heart of the beloved, not the lover. It's the love that is pulled from the beloved that makes you a lover. It's a different thing. It's, being, it's a pull. It's not being forced. And we are making this big mistake and calling all our attachments as if they were love. That's not love. When do you experience love of that kind? Where you are pulled without any effort. There are occasions that happen to us in life. Somebody pulls us so much strongly, we feel love. Everybody has experience of love. So far as I know, I don't know anybody who never had experience of love. 
they had experience of love but then they think about it then they bring the mind into it when the love comes there no mind there is no thought nobody thinks into love love comes when it comes then you start thinking is it real can i trust that person all the doubting mechanism of the mind comes into play and we destroy that experience of love thinking does not help how to love thinking destroys love unless you thinking only about the beloved which is not the kind of thinking that comments upon what is happening but our commentator mind comments doubts and destroys the experience of love except when the love flows in such a way that even the experience of a doubt of a mind cannot stop it and such an experience comes from what i call a perfect living master whose love is totally unconditional no expectations and that love pulls us and st- is so steady in our life that even the doubting mind ultimately is overridden overridden and the love prevails it can happen between any two people but the mind overwhelms us we are really living the mind's life which means the mind is our master what the mind thinks we carry out it is so sad that something given to us to be of service to us a servant has been given to us to help us the mind has been given to us as a servant as a slave that whatever we tell the mind it will do one mind think of this thing mind will think mind communicate this thing it will communicate mind speak up this thing it will speak it's very fond of speaking you know we call it thought thinking is speaking of the mind mind speaks continuously we give a little hint and it keeps on speaking it never stops speaking that means never stop thinking and those thoughts we listen to them and start acting upon them little realizing that those random bizarre thoughts that are running in the mind are not our instructions to the mind are not our using of the mind we are being used by the slave now we become the slaves of something that was given to us or as a service of service to us mind is a great servant if you use it i can tell you even now use your mind from tomorrow and you see how wonderful it is as a servant but as a master it's terrible that if all the time the thoughts tell you what to do not thoughts that you have directed the mind to think but let the mind think and what it says you follow then we putting cart before the horse we are doing something totally opposite to what was intended you can change even now any day you can change you can start using the mind instead of mind using you how by telling the mind what to think now how can you tell the mind how to think because mind is thinking to tell the mind what to think is also a thought so we make use of the very mechanism of thinking and divide it into what the mind thinks by itself and what our intuitive spiritual self tells the mind to do so we develop a spiritual will in opposition to the mental will when we develop a spiritual will which is based upon our spiritual awareness then tell the mind to do that then it becomes a servant of ours what is the quality nature of our spiritual will will depend upon what we have in consciousness when we are only spirit or soul without mind i want to tell you that when we are only spirit above the mind there are three functions we still go on performing we don't think we don't speak we don't do these things which we do when we have a mind without the mind we still have intuitive knowledge knowledge coming immediately instantaneously gut feeling no time involved every activity of the mind requires time the activity of the spirit or the soul takes no time big difference even the smallest thought takes time a gut feeling an intuitive feeling takes no time at all just comes now this intuitive feeling comes to us all the time the gut feeling everybody has 
It's the Spirit spoke, uh, speaking in us, telling us who we are. If you rely upon your intuition, this gut feeling, and then tell the mind to act accor according to what your gut feeling is, you will never go wrong. You won't next day say, oh, I could have done differently. Oh, I didn't know about it. These statements only come when you follow the mind blindly and don't direct it what to do. So that is why the spiritual will is developed from the functions which are taking place in the spirit. One, this intuitive knowledge. Two, love. Three, bliss. They are automatically there. When you have those experiences and use them to develop a spiritual will to control your mind, your mind follows you. Otherwise, you follow the mind. Out of these three, the easiest is intuition. The intuitive gut feeling that we get, we get all the time. Now, I feel like this. How do you say? I don't know. The mind says, don't do this. In inner voice, some inner thing is saying, do it. Where is that coming from? That's, and that didn't come by thinking about it, it came without thinking. If you give that preference over what you are thinking, life changes. You can try it out. Try for a week. If you don't want to try forever, try it for a week and you see the difference. In leading the mind to do what you want, rather than you doing what the mind wants. Now this intuition cannot be developed. A friend of mine once said, He's working very hard to develop his intuition. I said, I never heard of that, that you could develop an intuition. It's there already. <coughs> Development is a mental process. Give me an example. He said, I will show you how I use my developed intuition. So he said, I have to decide whether I will go east or west. Now, I want to leave this decision to my intuition. So I will close my eyes and wait for intuition and say, uh, go west. I said, what was that uh, about? That was thought. You didn't have an intuitive feeling. You thought about it. You thought very rapidly. You thought quickly. You thought it's intuition. That's not intuition. That's just a rapid thought. So rapid thought can't be called intuition. When intuition comes, there is no thought. It just comes. Not for me. Not going. It's just my gut feeling. What's a gut feeling? It's an intuitive feeling. It's just in the heart. It just comes like that. So it is that kind of feeling which gives you the spiritual will and use it through the same mind. The mind should implement what your intuitive self is saying and you won't go wrong. Why is that? Because when the mind thinks and tells you what to do, it has a very limited data in front of it on which it bases that advice. You can't remember everything. The mind has only small little data yeah, this is likely to happen, this is a good course for me, this is best, and let me do it. Next day you say, oh, I forgot that this is something else, and I failed. Because the mind's very information on which it is basing its advice to us is very limited. Whereas intuition is not coming from that basis at all, it's coming from the information stored in you for several lifetimes. It's a picking, picking up from your sinchit karma, your reserved karma, and all the subconscious elements that go with that reserved karma from where it comes instantaneously. It has a much larger base of information, and that's why it's turned out to be correct. There's a big difference between the two. That is why, as you go further with the use of intuition, your life changes. But can we always rely upon intuition? Some people have a big problem because the mind says, don't rely, rely on it. This is just a gut feeling. You can't rely on a gut feeling. So then, there's another, another arrangement we have made to verify if the gut feeling is reliable or not. Supposing you have a gut feeling that you should go west, not east. I'm just taking an example. That you should go west. All this sensory system says the goodies are lying on the east and the gut feeling is saying go west the intuitive feeling is saying go west you are in a dilemma now should i go west with my gut feeling is saying or should i go east you're driving and is a, a billboard comes in front which says go west 
Nothing to do with your thought. It's just a, a advertisement for something. Go west. As you say, where did that come from? Where did that ad come from? Or you're reading a book and it says, in Western societies, opening page, where's Western coming from again? These are called coincidences. A coincidental happening outside will confirm your intuitive self inside. It's a continuous process. Therefore, when these both take place, it confirms that your intuition is the right thing to do. And this will happen all the time. If you live a life like that, you will see every day, all the time, you'll get these coincidences. So many people have told me that since they came on the spiritual path, this coincidence have increased a lot. What is a coincidence? The coincidence merely means the happening of two events, which law of probability says it would not normally happen, but they happen. That's a coincidence. You say, how could that happen? How could I meet this friend saying the same thing? I was thinking about it and suddenly an intuitive flash came to me and was revealed by an outside thing. Sometimes people have referred to these two events as the work of the mind or the work of God. They think that there is God's will and there is man's will. That the creator divided the will into two because we had free will at least experience of free will, therefore he made our free will into man's will. And then he kept in his hand God's will. And then people want to live in God's will because God's will would be intuitive and man's will would be mental. So how do you know what is God's will? People say, is it everything God's will? Including the mental will is also God's will. If that were so, there wouldn't be no difference between the two. But there is. How do you know what is God's will? A famous uh, poet, mystic poet, Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, Morana Rum, he answers this question. He says, I have been asked, what is God's will? And I say, that is simple. If God puts a spade in your hand, he's expressed his will, dig. If God has put a pen in your hand, he's expressed his will, write. If God has created certain circumstances for you to act upon, act. That's God's will. But if you dilly-dally on that and start thinking, it's a mental will. So he explains, God's will is not difficult to find. The circumstances around you are telling you what to do. If you look at all the circumstances and perform your duty according to the circumstances as they come, because they will come because of your karma, your relationships, your children, your wife, your husband, your parents, your boss, your uh, employees, your jobs, all these things create reactions to them from your point of view. What comes in front of you comes from karma. What God's will requires you to do is your dharma. That's what they define karma and dharma in Hindu philosophy, that karma has been given to you because of your past actions. And those events will come in your life and become circumstances of your life. But how you react to them is your dharma. If you react as required at that time, then you are performing your dharma, your duty. Dharma is like duty, a duty in response to your karma. So when we are able to do that, we will find the intuitive self is giving you what would be called God's will. And the mental self is what you think out and say you are doing it. They all tally with each other. So there are many ways in which one can understand this. But the thing is to live it. To live in this and make the mind your servant and not your boss. We have made it a boss for too long and allowed it to run our lives. We have made it such a strong boss, we even forget who we are. We have started thinking we are the mind. We have almost identified ourselves with our servant. When we think, we say, I am thinking. That's not a true statement even. You say, I am thinking, that's not correct. I, the soul, the consciousness with the power to make anything alive, am making my mind, which I am empowering with my life, to think. That's the correct thing. That we are empowering the mind to perform its function. We are plugging the power plug into a computer. It doesn't mean we become a computer. But that's what we are doing. 
mind is not very different from a computer. It functions like a computer. The best computers are designed like the mind. So the mind is to be used and the power plug is our soul to make it operational, to make it work. We make the mind work and then we misidentify ourselves with the mind. That's bad enough, but it's worse when we not only identify ourselves with the mind, we identify ourselves with the functions of the mind, which are sense perceptions. Which I am seeing, my eyes are seeing, I am the doer. No, you're using your mind to see. The soul is using the mind and the eyes to see. We forget that, that we are not, we are not part of the eyes. So we misidentify ourselves with the mind, we misidentify ourselves with the senses, and we ultimately misidentify ourselves with the body, thinking this is me, you know, nothing else. Oh, all this stuff inside is merely, merely life. It's a brain working and the life is there. We don't know what life is, but it becomes life, and we live, and then we die. So something happens, but our, our self is only what is born, what grows up, and dies. It's finished. People say there's afterlife, maybe, we haven't seen it. We were there before birth, previous life. Some people believe, maybe it's just a story, we don't know. We know this thing, that right now we are in this body. Which makes me come up to the point I was trying to raise in the morning, that when we say we are living in this body, we are living in this experience, are we really living in this experience or is it just an experience created by something else? And to explain this point, I'll tell you what time is for us. Time is a very, very important factor in creating these experiences. In fact, we call it the negative power. The translation of the word time in Hindi and Sanskrit is Kal. And we always say call the negative power. Little realizing negative power call is time itself. It's a, it's a literal translation. The time is the one that's caught us up into this whole miserable situation which we say is pairs of opposites, little bit of pleasure and lot of sorrow and suffering. Why so much, so much sorrow and suffering compared to a little pleasure? Actually, it's not true that there is more sorrow. It looks like that. Because time as a subjective factor makes the pleasure go quickly and sorrow go slowly. Even if you have equal time, even if you have your pleasure and pain equally divided, it will look like the pleasure went very quickly and the pain is still continuing. In fact, Oscar Wilde in his famous essay on suffering says suffering is one long moment. When a moment does not seem to pass, it's suffering. And it passes quickly, you are enjoying yourself. You can be sitting with people and chatting away and how much time has passed? 10 minutes? No, one hour is gone. Let's go. It's one hour over. Because we were chatting and enjoying the time. Now you start meditation and say, now must be two hours past, 10 minutes. What's the difference? The clock is giving the same answers to both your situations. But we are relying upon the time given by your timepieces and our clocks. We don't rely upon our subjective time. The, the time we are experiencing is our subjective time, not the clock time at all. But we think it's the clock time that is really the real time. Okay, let me discuss with you briefly what is real time. Real time that we experience makes us believe that there is a past, already gone. I came here, I started speaking, now it's gone, it's past. I'm speaking now, it is present. What I will say later on will be future. All our time experience in our head is based upon an existence of these three things, past, present and future. You all think like that. Nobody has any time sequence other than this in the physical world. So, we say, this is present. Did you know before I could say this word present, it was future. The moment I started uttering it, it was going into the past. 
I could not complete the word present in the present. I could not complete it in what is called now. Some people tell me, there's a book on the subject, live in the now. I said, I want to meet anybody in the world who is not living in the now. We are all living in the now. We have no escape from it. We can't go in any other time frame except now. We are tied to now. That's a, that's a big trap. That we are tied to now and somebody is telling live in the now, we are living in it now. What we are calling now has no time. It's a complete junction of a past and future with no dimension of its own. Not even a nanosecond. The moment a nanosecond passes, it's past. Before it came, it's the future. So now has no time whatsoever. And we are all living in the now. That means we are living in no time. Yet we feel we are living in time. How can that be? If, if the only period with which we are alive is now, which is the present, and present has no time at all, it's a ju junction between the past and the future, how come we feel we are living in the time? Let us see. What are these three components? The present, the past, and the future. When you examine the present, what we are calling present, it is actually immediate past. When I speak to you, a few words are spoken, I have just spoken to you in the present, though it was, they were in the past. Because nothing can be spoken in now. So when I spoke, they were in past. So what we are calling present is not present really. It's an immediate past, we call it, call it present. So it's really past. So present is past. What is past? What you can remember, it happened and it's gone. And that's past. So past is past and present is also past. What about future? What's the nature of future? Let's consider that if our consciousness was not capable of performing three functions, hope, fear, anticipation. If we never hope for anything, if we never fear anything, if we never anticipate anything, future disappears. Have you ever thought of that? That the future is being created by these activities only. It's only one activity. It's actually anticipation. When it's positive, we call it hope. When it's negative, we call it fear. But if we can't hope and we can't fear and we can't anticipate, there is no future. Future is entirely created by these functions. Three functions alone, which is one function, and is done what we call in the present, which is the past. The future is entirely in the past. Can you imagine what we are going through as time and think it is past, present and future is all past? You can examine it thoroughly. It's all past. The only way to know the past is through memory, through recall. In other way we have. Therefore, what we call actual living here is really a recall of the past. That's the only thing we can do to get into the past. And past, present and future are all past. We are living through a recall, a very living, vivid recall of our memories. And we call it life. Now this is not visible to us at all. And we don't take it like that. If you go to a higher level of awareness, you'll find that's exactly how it's, it's being processed. From the causal plane, which sometimes we call the Akashic records, Akash, Akashic record, whatever way you pronounce it, that there's a sky in which all the destinies are written up. They are rec records of our destinies. That we ourselves have pulled out a little DVD from there of our life. And we come into this astral form, then we bring the DVD and start playing DVD there, then we bring it to physical form and we start playing our DVD, we call it our destiny. And destiny starts working. It's a memory only of that DVD we have pulled up. We are replaying a memory. Because memory is only of something that's already there. You don't create memories as you go along. Therefore, we don't create anything here. We are living in something that's already pre-recorded and made into a memory chip or something, put into our consciousness and we create a whole sense of past, present and future through the memory. That we are reliving memories is a very great experience to discover 
through your self-awareness and going to a higher state of awareness. So your whole concept of life will change with that experience because we are trapped by an illusion that present is real, past is real, future is real, because the events seem to be so connected with each other through cause and effect. That's the secret. You connect these memories by cause and effect, they become real. That's the law of karma. Karma is the most complex law. People just define it very simply, action, reaction, whatever you do, if you do good things, you are rewarded, do bad things, you are punished. It's not as simple as that. Karma is so strange that our thought and intentions is creating karma, not actions. Karma is not that the action has to be performed in order to have karma. The intention to act creates karma. When you act upon the intention, it becomes a deeper karma. And the reward and punishment goes according to your intention as well as your action. That's a big difference. See how much intentions we create every day. We are constantly thinking, I wish I could kill that person. But you don't kill. You're too afraid of getting killed yourself. But you have created a karma of intention to kill. This will remain. I hate that person, but society says I should love him. Okay, I love you. <laughs> what? We do this all the time. We do these things which make us create karma at such a rapid rate. It's unbelievable how quickly we create this karma based upon this whole concept of time and this time frame and events all the time. And there is no way we create trillions of karmic features in one lifetime and be very little time in the next lifetime to pay off for that karma. So it's only a few pieces from here and there picked up. Okay, last time you did this thing, we can't put the whole thing in one life. It'll take hundred lives, maybe million lives to do it. So we'll pick up some of those things. There's your new life. What happened to the rest? We'll store it for you in a big reservoir inside the mind. Big reservoirs will become not karma and karma which you are performing, not problems with which you are born from past life, but sinchit karma, a reservoir of karma that, that remains tied up. And we call it sinchit karma. It's very, it's, it's, it's very good in its application because when we have an attitude, it's different from an event. Somebody hit you, you hit him. That's karma of action. Somebody actually hit you with the intention to hit you. You hit him back with the intention to hit him back. Okay, paid off. Karma paid off. These are events. But this, what about the attitude? P pessimistic attitude. Optimistic attitude. Attitude of laughing all the time or anything. Attitude of uh, crying all the time. Where do these come from? They are not events. Those attitudes have been called sanskars. That is our sanskar, different from pralab or kreman or sinchit, sanskar. How we look at anything in our life with that particular attitude. That comes entirely from the sinchit karma. That's why the sinchit karma is affecting our life also. The reservoir of so much karma. So our life is being guided by so many things which is all based upon time and the timeline. So time is a call. Time is a negative power that can never let you go out. Because in time we function with our intentions and create a trap for ourselves of birth, rebirth, rebirth again and again because we can never finish this. Sometimes we get the idea that maybe, maybe we did some bad things and now we have to atone for them. Let's do some good things and we'll cover up our bad things. That's not the law of karma. It doesn't say that. Law of karma says, did bad things, punished. Did good things, rewarded in time. One after the other. You did bad things then, punishment here. Afterwards you did good things, after that you get rewarded. It follows the timeline, exactly. You cannot cancel anything in karma. That's, that's, a very big trap.
you can't get out of you cannot get out of your karmic pattern just by karma by more karma more karma traps you even more so therefore you can't get out from this i think there's something going on in my machine <laughs> i forgot to turn it off sorry people send me lot of songs and i don't know as our beautiful songs also but lot of songs tell us that we are in trouble <laughs> and nothing new we all know it now i am talking of the nature of time kal how it creates this process of karma and how the events and the attitudes hold us back and we create karma at a very fast pace it's a sinchit karma that holds us back forever and no amount of good work that you can do no amount of charity can do anything it can change your next lifestyle into a better lifestyle but you will be here you can't get out the system does not provide for an escape at all where is karma where is it actually is not on our bodies if it were bodies when the body dies karma would die with it it's not in our sensory perceptions they also die some point is on our minds karma is created by the mind is followed up by the mind is paid off through the mind and stored in the mind mind is a powerful thing it's a very long lasting thing this body of ours has a very limited lifestyle lifetime maybe 100 years less than that little more than that and the inner self the sensory system which constitute our sukshma sharir our finer body our sensory body has a lifetime in physical time 1000 to 3000 physical years still a short period the mind lasts 3 to 5 million years of physical time one one mind in one mind you can have so many lifetimes both on the astral plane and the sensory plane and in the physical plane the whole storage of this karma takes place on that mind which has a long life and we keep on having the same mind carrying the karma from one life to another it's not paid off by the body or paid off or cancelled by our astral self that is why it is so deep rooted and this is a big prison in which we are this physical world is a small prison compared to the prison of our time of our mind and time they create a prison forever no escape you can examine it if there's any escape anywhere in, in the system the system is full proof to not let you escape from it do good get reward there is a saying in punjabi tapo raj rajo nark narko tap tapo raj is a cycle three three points you move with three points that you do lot of tap good deeds meditation things and you are rewarded you become raja you get to king you become big person you become money person rewarded then you is money person you like to commit sins and then from there you go to hell nark in nark you say never again never again as you come back and do tap then you tap you become raj raj to nark nark to tap what a cycle that's how we are going on in the same cycle over and over again never able to get out of it you go to higher place or lower place it's all within the same same creation mental creation no escape at all that makes it so difficult you can be as enlightened as you want to be enlightenment which gives you all the knowledge of how this world is being run how it's being created who is running it all the knowledge you can get and then come back here bhagwan krishna worshiped by so many people because he was an avatar he had knowledge he was a young boy when he had knowledge and he was taking care of cows of the village along with his friend udo udo and krishna udo and krishna both used to go tending to their cows and grazing them and taking them back home according to the record they have recorded their conversation one of these very important one where krishna says krishna lord krishna says to udo udo karman ki gat nyari se this is the language they use where krishna was born i heard it there i went to the place where krishna was born 
and the area of Vrindavan and all that area is toward that area to see how people are remembering a avatar that was born there. So I saw that the poor people there are very happy because they sing this songs. This is the refrain of one of the songs. Are Udo Karman ki Gatnyari se, which means Udo, you don't know the nature of this karma. And then Udo explains to him what he's talking about. He says, there is an ant crawling here. Do you, Udo, see that ant crawling here? Looks like a little insect. Once it has been Brahma, the creator of this universe. Once it has been Indra, Indra, the ruler of one of the big heavens in the astral plane. And because of his karma, he still become an ant after that. That when he had such great deeds to do, he became the creator of this whole mental universe. And because of his past karma before that, he had to become an insect today. He said, there's no way to get out. The nature of karma is not understood easily by us. We always think there can be atonement. And many people do come to us. They say that uh, for your bad karma, we can pray for you and get rid of your bad karma. All they want is a little fee. They, they are India, in India, they want a lot of rice and they want some little cash also and some other goodies, and they'll pray for you to get rid of your karma. And you add, by giving them money, you add more karma. Next time they have to give you. In this, in this country, United States, where I am living now, they are teddy evangelists. They come on TV. For all your sins, we can pray for you. Just send $25. Or if you want better service, $50. If you want, the, if you want your sins to be washed off faster, 100. It's great business. You add more karma by doing this. There is no escape like this. So there's no atonement system in the law of karma. How do we get rid of this karma? How can we escape? Is there any way to escape? Only one way that I am aware of to be pulled beyond the mind and leave all karma behind. To go back to our original state where we were never the mind. We were souls. Go back to your spiritual self. There's no karma there. Everything we leave behind. Because it's all on the mind. To go beyond the mind is true spirituality. The spiritual path I have been sharing with you since morning is not a path of going and giving inner experiences. Some people say, I have great inner experiences. I see a lot of colors and lights. I said, if I hit you on the head, you'll see them again. <laughs> what is this? You call it spiritual experience because you saw some colors when you were closing your eyes. You can press on the side of the eye. You can see even the inner part of your retina. Do you know that? You can push your eyes back and forth and you change the, uh, the shadows coming into opposite colors. These are simple optical things that are happening here. Is this spirituality to say, I saw something in my dream? You're still dreaming. How do you raise your awareness beyond the mind? You can't do it. There's no way to do it except by being pulled by somebody who's beyond the mind. That is why this path comes down to only one thing, love and devotion. That's the way. Love and devotion. Love that pulls us, devotion is our response to that love. These two words are always used together, love and devotion, love and devotion. Why? Because love is pulling us and our being pleased and happy to please somebody who is our beloved is our devotion. If you live a life of love and devotion, you are a spiritual being. If you want to meditate, do it only with love and devotion. Mechanical meditation does nothing. I'll tell you my personal experience with a friend, a colleague of mine. He's passed away, so I can even give you his name. His name was Hira Singh lived in Ludhiana. He had a foundry. He was initiated by the great master. Same Satguru I followed. He was given Nam dance. He was given initiation by the same master. Many years have passed. He was living separately. I was going in my civil service posted very far away. He was running his foundry and his little factory in Ludhiana, in a little town. But he was a very good disciple. He did his meditation regularly. 
he observed the vegetarian diet which was prescribed very regularly being very conscious of it he led a very nice moral life i must confess my life was not like that but he was really a puritanical satsangi that means pure satsangi follow the instruction to the letter one of the masters not from the dera from another dera nearby came he, all the masters came to his house he had a big house and they used to have satsang the discourse in his house a big lawn he had so they would put up a tent master would come and 200 300 people would attend the satsang in his house he invited all the masters they came to his house they gave satsangs he was very happy he was very blessed one day i was in the united states i took a friend of mine who was working with me here and was following the spiritual path i took him to india to show him my childhood memories of the dera and other places ultimately i said i will take you to hira singh's house he is a colleague of mine initiated by the same master when we went there there was satsang going on by another master so we stood outside the master recognized us and called us and i went up i knew the master that particular master was a wrestler actually and he became master and there's a lot of story about that too but when i met him he said very good where are you coming i said I brought a friend from america to see you he said okay i said finish the satsang we'll wait for you then see you he, he said satsang over <laughs> i got up <laughs> we were surprised at his prompt reaction we went in and we chatted with him lot of other satsangis were there they came to me they asked simple questions about meditation and some other small small questions about karma whatever i'm sharing with you i was sharing with them by question and answer and then hira singh took me aside and he said i have a question i said hira singh what is your question my question is that we are both initiates of the same master i have done everything that was required to be on this path regular meditation two and a half hours every day i have followed the diet i have followed the instructions i have got nothing inside i have not seen anything inside people talk about it i read it in the books i never got anything inside it appears from the way you talk you must have got something otherwise how can you answer these questions i said he is saying i want to let you know a little secret the secret is i don't give answer to people's questions when they ask me a question i ask my master inside master this is the question what is the answer whatever answer he gives i deliver people think i am giving the answer they don't know my secret <laughs> he said my question is ask your master or my master too ask our master why there is so much discrimination that i followed his instructions to the letter and got nothing and you i don't know how follow how much you followed your instruction i didn't okay <laughs> that, that's on the side and you didn't or you did but you got something out of it why this discrimination i said look this is a very difficult question my master also takes time to answer difficult questions i'll put it to him and when he delivers his answer i'll give it to you he says go inside we'll give you a private room you have a contact with your master meditate and talk to him and give me answer i said master is not so free that any time you can call and get answers he takes time he says how much time will the master great master take to give you an answer to my question i said normally about 6 months <laughs> you know why i said that because i was my next trip to india was 6 6 months i must tell you a little i try to be a little clever but don't call it cheating <laughs> i said it takes 6 months anyway i satisfied him for the time being i came back to united states i went after 6 months i visited him again i said got the answer answer i got for you answer was very simple they gave you the answer when you went to them every time you went to great master you put the same question to him why am i not making progress and what did he do he smiled and said no continue your meditation with love and devotion 
you went to other masters and you put the same question to them and they gave you the same answer they smiled and said continue your meditation with love and devotion you didn't understand their answer you continue to meditate without love and devotion you continue to meditate mechanically thinking it's a mechanical process that you just have to put your attention there to sit there and everything will happen nothing happened because this is a path of love and devotion not of mechanical meditation at all and i said you masters tell us an example that if you are preparing butter you know in, in india we prepare butter by using milk or curd and just using madani or madani something to stir it with and they say if you keep on stirring that in water butter will never come out even if you do it all your life but if you do it in a proper way with the milk or curds butter will come he said mechanical meditation is like churning that madani in water it doesn't have real value in a spiritual path you are doing this for 40 years you have been doing this didn't work i brought the answer to you please remember this answer i am going to come back in 6 months again to check out if it worked so he came back to the united states and next visit i visited him again he made more progress in 6 months than he had made in 40 years i am emphasizing the importance of the real thing in meditation is love and devotion without love and devotion it's hollow mechanical but many of us are caught up in that we think it's a mechanical or mental exercise it's not this is spiritual exercise you want spiritual results then do the spiritual way that's with love and devotion how many of you would actually like to meditate with me while i'm on this visit very good tomorrow we'll do it if you are really interested tomorrow we'll meditate i'll tell you how it is done effectively and tell you how it is done with love and devotion so expect results tomorrow tonight prepare <laughs>
How can we make such a mistake? Every religion that I, I studied, 11 religions, at Harvard University when I was a scholar for something else, and I found they're all talking of this stuff that is inside, that comes from inside. To catch it, we have to go inside. Now to do those things, we're talking of real stuff. We're not talking of spoken words. We're not spoke, we're talking of books and literature. These books we can go, keep on reading, keep on reading forever. They don't take us in. So to go in within, we must take the first step. And the very first step is to start by being your non-physical self behind the eyes from where it, the journey starts. That's why I gave you a very simple homework for tonight. And tomorrow we'll proceed from there and go on from spoken words to the highest sound that we can ever hear. Spoken words are called varanathamaksham. Those that can be spoken, that can be written, used for communication. This is varanathmak shabd is a very temporary thing in spirituality. Of course, they're useful. If I didn't, I'm speaking to you in varanathmak shabd now. If I never spoke to you, you won't even know what homework to do. So varanathmak shabd takes us up to a point of understanding from where practice can start. But when you go inside and hear the sounds inside, which are not spoken words, not your thoughts, then that sound is called dhonatmik shabd. This is dhon. It's a sound with no words. It's not one that we write and we communicate with. Yet it's something that pulls us inside. When we have an actual experience that we can hear the sound inside and rise with the sound to still higher level, from astral to causal level, it changes. It becomes entering into a sound that you feel you are always in the sound. That you are not hearing it from now. You enter into the sound where you know you were hearing that sound forever. It had no beginning, no middle and end. The dhonatmak shabd becomes the anhad shabd, which has no beginning, no middle and no end. And your experience is that. Then you go even higher, beyond the mind, by the pull of a master's perfect unconditional love. And the sound changes again. It becomes sar shabd, as described, sar shabd. Real creative sound, do you find that that is not a sound, it's the creative power that's creating you and everything else. It's the sound of spirituality of the soul. And that doesn't end there. You can go and merge in totality and find that we call the same thing as sat shabd, the true sound, which is the same thing as totality of consciousness or the creative power. These are experiences that can start from here. That is why this particular way of getting to know yourself has been called the Surta Shabda Yoga to distinguish it from other yogas. There are so many yogas involving only physical exercise. There are yogas that can give you peace of mind by withdrawing attention. There are yogas that can take you higher up to mental levels. But this is the yoga that takes you beyond the mind, beyond all these. So I have practiced all others also. That was a challenge given to me by my own, own master. Find something better. So I looked for something better. That's why I tried all these other things too. Ultimately, I found out that the best thing I could use was this Sut Shabd Yoga that can take you to the highest place. If practiced properly with love and devotion, under guidance of one who already is aware of this thing. Period. So that is why I am talking of that stuff. Not lectures. We can hear lectures and read books all the time. They don't do anything except to make us more egoistic. I have read more books than you. We argue, no, I know more than you because I can quote more things than other people. At one time I could quote almost half of the Guru Gantha and I convinced my friends, I, you, you tell me, I'll give you an answer from your own scripture. That is quotations of books. That doesn't take you inside. It's just outside, more ego. I know more than you. And this ego is itself an ob obstacle on the spiritual way. I-ness keeps you divided. Then you say, I, you are stating your current situation of imprisonment in time and ego. You have separated yourself. There is no real I. There is only one, how can there be an I? When there is no separation, how can there be an I? I, the ego, is a, is a block in our spiritual development. And when we read too much, we hear too much, 
and we know too many words, we develop a more eye, bigger eye. That doesn't help. The smaller the eye it is, the better it is. But as a one word of caution about the small eye, somebody says, I am the lowest of the low and the humblest of the humble. His ego is very strong. If he says, I am the strongest of the strong, we can beat him down. You are not. When he says, I am the humblest of the humble, you can't beat that eye. It's a more sinister eye when somebody claims to be so humble. I am so humble. These are all words. These words don't take you anywhere. So that is why rely upon a practical personal experience which gives you an insight into your real self. That's why I'm willing to do meditation with you, to show you what I'm talking about. Give you a little homework. Practice sitting there. It'll make the tomorrow's exercises better. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to spend time with you. I'll uh, meet a few people who have asked for personal time or interview. And then I'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock or so again. Thank you.